Hi there. I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more conversations. Donald Trump stands charged in four felony indictments, two federal and two state, with 91 serious violations of law. Ironically, even if he were to be convicted of all pending charges before the November 2024 election, he would not be disqualified from running for the office or winning the presidency. There is, however, litigation arising out of the attack on the Capitol on January 6, 2021, that might throttle his plans to be reseated in the Oval Office. Lawsuits are pending in 21 states aimed to keep him off the ballot on grounds that he is disqualified by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. That provision requires disqualification of anyone who has previously taken an oath to support the Constitution, who has engaged in insurrection or rebellion against it. One of the lawsuits is winding down towards completion in Colorado. Here to help us understand the issues is Kermit Roosevelt, a constitutional law expert who is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania's Cary Law School. We're honored and pleased to welcome Kermit Roosevelt to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Well, Kermit, this is a fascinating issue. And uh, the first thing that comes to mind, which is the first thing that uh, the Supreme Court likes to ask, is uh, who has standing to bring a lawsuit under Section 3 of uh, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution? Well, that's an interesting question, and we don't really know. We haven't had lawsuits involving this much before. But the position that most people who are trying to enforce this provision take is this is a qualification for holding office like any other, like the president has to be a natural born citizen, the president has to be at least 35 years old. So anyone, and some states have particular rules about who can enforce these, anyone who would be able to enforce any other office holding qualification can go to court for this, or maybe state secretaries of state who are supposed to determine who's eligible to run in their state can enforce it. Um, but either way, once you get into court, if you've got a decision, that decision is going to go up to the U.S. Supreme Court eventually. So uh, if I'm 16 years old and I'm a stable genius, it's clear I'm not qualified uh, under the Constitution and any commissioner of elections can disqualify me. Right. Someone's going to stop you. Right. We've got a real rule. It's there in the Constitution. It's clear. The rule says you can't be president we're not going to let you be president. How exactly that happens depends a little on the intricacies of state election law, who can challenge it, what the different officials' roles are. But if there's a clear prohibition in the Constitution, it should be enforced. Now, you've written that the prospect of disqualifying uh, someone from a presidential ballot is a momentous possibility. What did you mean by that? Well, absolutely. So, you know, fundamentally, I believe America is supposed to be a democracy. Um, you know, not a direct democracy necessarily, but the people are supposed to make the big decisions. Who becomes president? That's a really big decision. And it's for that reason that, as you said, you can be convicted of a very serious crime and still be become president, right? You can run for president from jail, as Eugene Debs did. But we say in the Constitution, there are some things that are beyond the pale, right? There are some things that if you do them, now you can't be president. So it's taking a very important decision away from the American people, but sometimes the Constitution does that too, right? Sometimes the Constitution protects us from things that we might think are a good idea at the moment, but that history has shown are actually very dangerous and destructive. Of course, the argument is that to disqualify them is anti-democracy. Let the voters decide. Let them be disqualified at the ballot box. Let them not be disqualified by the judges. Uh, and indeed, our early constitutional history suggests that uh, the framers didn't want the judges to make these decisions. They wanted it to be done as provided. Uh, so what's the answer to that? Well, so one thing is, yet yeah, the practice of judicial review has changed a lot since the founding. And we've got much more aggressive judges. We've got the court playing a larger role in determining a lot of questions that maybe it wouldn't have been deciding. This, I think, is pretty much a legal question that judges can decide. Um, and on the question, is it anti-democratic, it sort of depends on what you mean or what your frame of reference is for that. So you could say, well, taking any decision away from the people is anti-democratic. And in a sense, that's true. But again, right, we're not a direct democracy. We do put some limits on who can become president. Um, you know, is it a good 
rule that you have to be 35, or is it anti-democratic? I'm not sure. Um, natural born citizen, that's anti-democratic. I don't like that requirement so much. I think that naturalized citizens should probably be eligible. But in this case, we're barring from office people who have shown themselves to be enemies of the Constitution, which is enemies of our democratic republic. And history actually tells us something about what happens when you let those people back into power. Because this provision, everyone agrees, it's enacted in the wake of the Civil War. It's designed to prevent some former Confederates from reassuming political power. But Congress forgave a lot of those people. Congress can lift this disability. It did it. We got those former Confederates back in power, and they destroyed democracy. So uh, Trump is really kettle calling with pot black when he says it's anti-democracy to disqualify. Well, right. So it's anti-democratic. The voters should decide. You hear all of those arguments. But it's very strange to hear those arguments coming from people who were unwilling to accept the results of a free and fair and open election, right? And that's why we're in this situation. We let the people decide. They picked Joe Biden. Trump and his team wouldn't accept that. They came up with this massive conspiracy scheme to allege fraud in lots of different states, and they had over 60 lawsuits, and they lost almost all of them. And they came up with this scheme to have slates of fake electors. And they came up with this idea that Mike Pence had unilateral authority to not certify the real vote count. Um, and then when Pence wouldn't go along with that, they had a mob storm the Capitol. So let's assume that, and of course, uh, Trump sat around watching television for three and a half hours when he had a duty as uh, the chief executive uh, to uh, make sure the laws are faithfully executed uh, to uh, stop it. And he didn't do it uh, for three and a half hours. And when he did do it, uh, they went away. They stood down. So it showed that he controlled the mob that was uh, storming the Capitol. It's pretty damning evidence of his uh, participation. Yeah, I think so. I mean, so there, there are a lot of questions about how to interpret what happened. You know, we know some facts about what happened on January 6th. There are a lot of questions about how to interpret that, what Trump's role was, how it connects to the broader scheme. But as I understand it, it looks like there was a pretty coordinated plan to overturn the results of the 2020 election which is to make president someone who is not legally entitled to be president. That is to take over the executive branch of the United States government. Um, and it was supposed to be bloodless. It was supposed to be done in this cloak of legality. So you've got the lawsuits and they have these wacky constitutional theories, but it didn't work, right? The relevant officials wouldn't go along with it. The judges rejected the suits. Pence said, no, I don't have the authority to do this. And then it actually turned violent. So, I mean, that's an attempt to take over the United States government by force. And Trump is certainly a part of that, right? Trump is encouraging people to march to the Capitol, to give Mike Pence the courage that he needs. Trump is warned that people in the crowd are armed, and he says, take down the metal detectors. They're not here to hurt me. Um, he tries to go to the Capitol himself, and the Secret Service has to restrain him. So it certainly looks to me like and you can have a full hearing. I think we should. You can have people presenting all sorts of evidence. But it looks to me like Trump was intimately involved in a plan to take over the United States government that turned violent. And that really seems to me like an insurrection. Now, suppose the court in Colorado, which is holding a hearing or after a hearing, uh, concludes uh, and finds that Trump was engaged in an insurrection. Isn't that binding on uh, other states where the issue might be presented? Well, so that's an interesting question, and it's a kind of complicated interjurisdictional preclusion issue, and different states have different laws about that. I think ultimately the answer is going to be that this is kind of a legal question. It's kind of a question of law, or at least a mixed question of law and fact. So in the ordinary civil case where the question is like, did you run the red light? Um, a finding on that, a finding of fact, it's just about fact, it can bind you in other suits. In this case, there are a lot of legal questions. What's an insurrection? What degree of participation is required? So I think it's unlikely that he's going to be absolutely precluded. And I think it's unlikely that the Supreme Court is going to do anything but just decide that question on its own. Now, suppose uh, Colorado, but no other state, finds that he's to be disqualified from the ballot 
which might be a precedent in states that are reluctant to do it in the absence of uh, some judicial finding. Will that case inevitably go to the Supreme Court? Well, I think probably, and I think it should. You know, conceivably, if Trump loses in only one state, he could just say, forget about Colorado, I'm going to win in the other states, particularly if he thinks his Supreme Court chances are bad. But that would be a bad outcome, I think. We don't want inconsistent rules. We don't want some states saying he can be on the ballot and others not. Um, you know, Abraham Lincoln actually managed to win the presidency without being on the ballot in 10 of the 11 states that were going to secede. But generally speaking, you want people in every state to have the same array of choices. So if even one state decides against Trump, or really regardless of how the decisions go, I think we really need a Supreme Court decision giving us a uniform answer for the whole country. But it has to come up as a case of controversy. It can't, we just can't ask them to uh, give us an advisory opinion. Yeah, that's true. Um, so the federal jurisdiction depends on a case or controversy, and federal courts can't decide all of the cases that states courts can, so sometimes there are differences there. But if Trump loses, if there's a decision that excludes him from the ballot, he's definitely injured by that. He's definitely got standing to take that to the Supreme Court. Um, and even if he wins, probably based on the state law, there are people who are injured. So the idea that this is going to end up being dismissed for lack of standing, I think, is unlikely. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other issues. I mean, suppose the Supreme Court uh, assumes or uh, finds based on the Colorado finding that the Trump was engaged in insurrection. There's still the issue of, number one, is uh, Section 3 of the 14th Amendment self-executing? Or does it take an act of Congress uh, to uh, implement it? What's the answer there? Well, we don't really know. And actually, there are inconsistent precedents on this from lower courts. but. My view is the simplest answer is, of course, it's self-executing. Now, it sort of depends on what you mean by self-executing. So it doesn't set up a process by which it's going to be enforced. The states do that through whatever process they have to determine whether someone is eligible to be on the ballot. But is it self-executing in the sense that does it disqualify him by its own force? Well, I would say the provision that says the president has to be 35 disqualifies people by, their, by its own force. The provision that says you have to be a natural born citizen, those are self-executing in the relevant sense. And Section 3 is written in the same terms. I don't think there's any obvious reason to think that it's not self-executing in that same way. Now, um, Section 3 of uh, the 14th Amendment uh, provides that uh, two-thirds uh, vote of both houses of Congress can remove the disability or the disqualification, doesn't that suggest that others might impose the disqualification? Well, no, I, I mean, think... I mean, why would they have said that if uh, Congress, uh, only Congress could uh, impose the disqualification? Well, I think it actually suggests the opposite, right, which is that the Constitution imposes the disqualification and then Congress can remove it through an affirmative act of Congress. So if the question is, what happens if Congress does nothing? I think the answer is the Constitution imposes the disability by itself. You don't need Congress to pass a law saying this disability exists, because the Constitution says so. Well, I mean, suppose I'm the commissioner of uh, uh, elections in uh, Iowa, and I read the Constitution, and they say, all right, Trump, you're off the ballot. Uh, the, uh, it's no answer to say only Congress uh, can uh, disqualify, uh, because it, it I mean, my interpretation of uh, the 14th Amendment is it says that, that Congress, by two-thirds vote, can remove the disqualification. Yeah, exactly. Uh, right. Congress can remove it. Congress doesn't need to impose it. The Constitution uh, itself does that. Okay. Now, there seems to be some controversy over whether uh, when uh, the 14th Amendment refers to an office, it doesn't refer to the president, whether the president is included in the... Uh, array of uh, public officials who might be disqualified. Uh, is, uh, is there anything to that? I mean, the, the uh, Second Amendment, uh, I'm sorry, Article 2, which provides for the executive power, mentions uh, the word office about nine times. Right. With regard to the president. Yeah, so it turns out, you know, it's sort of interesting 
if you look at all of the times the Constitution says office and all of the times it says officer, um, you can come up with a theory about how the president actually isn't an officer of the United States because at some points we talk about the president appointing officers, but the president doesn't appoint himself. Um, so there are theories there, but basically I prefer a kind of common sense approach. So the theories that say, oh, this doesn't reach the president, rely on the sort of very complicated method of reading the Constitution and looking at different clauses and saying, oh, they all connect in this sort of mysterious way. It's what I think of as like the national treasure approach to constitutional interpretation, where there's this mysterious but completely coherent code that was written deep in the past and we have to figure it out and then we'll know the right answer. Um, I don't think that's what the Constitution is, honestly. I think the Constitution is a document that was written by a bunch of different people at a bunch of different points in our history. So when the 14th Amendment comes along, we're over a century removed from the founding. Um, and so I don't think that you can look at all of these different provisions and assume that they come together in some mysterious, complicated way. I think you should use the common sense understanding. So if we talk about the office of the presidency and we talk about the oath of office and we say that someone who holds an office is an officer, it seems pretty clear to me the president counts. I mean, Jefferson Davis uh, was uh, Secretary of War prior to the Civil War. He was a, a congressman. He was a United States senator, took an oath to uh, uh, support the Constitution. I mean, is there any way that uh, in the 19th century uh, uh, people reading uh, the 14th Amendment would have allowed him to uh, run for president? Well, I don't think so. And so, you know, again, there are complicated arguments that you can make here, but the straightforward argument seems to me this is about keeping traitors out of public office. And gosh, the presidency is an important office. It wouldn't make a lot of sense to exclude that. So obviously, there's a particular historical context, which is they're thinking about senators and representatives coming back from the former Confederate states, because that's already happened. The former Confederate states have tried to send former Confederates back to Congress. That's what this is responding to, but they write it more broadly. They write it to apply to all officers, and certainly that should include the president. Well, you're an originalist. Uh, is there any way that the original understanding of the language of uh, the 14th Amendment would have said, well, uh, we're going to disqualify traitors uh, from being congressmen or senators, uh, but not the highest office in the land. That's uh, for traitors, uh, the door is wide open. That would be a terrible, terrible interpretation. Um, yeah, it doesn't really make sense. So, you know, it's an interpretation based on this very complex reading of different constitutional provisions that seems to undermine the most important, probably, application of this constitutional provision, which is you don't want a traitor in charge of the federal government. Uh, now, another uh, issue is that the 14th Amendment says uh, someone who has taken an oath to support the Constitution. And Trump argues that he didn't take that oath. He took an oath to preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution. Is there anything to, to such an argument? Well, no. I mean, this is exactly the same kind of argument. It's this sort of textual gotcha, <laughs> right? He's like, I said I would preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution, not support it. But sort of two points there. One, put yourself in the mind of the people writing this or the people ratifying it. Would they have thought they were saying the crucial thing is did, the, did you say the word support or did you say something else? Obviously not, right? That's not what they would have thought. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and then if you think about what preserve, protect, and defend actually means, that means support, right? It's included. It's the same thing. So again, this kind of hyper-technical reading of the Constitution on the theory that there's some super complicated design that everyone understood at the time, but we just sort of forgot about, um, it just doesn't seem plausible to me. Another uh, argument that uh, has been brooded about uh, is, uh, well, the 14th Amendment was a Civil War Amendment. It was, and when they wrote about traitors, uh, possibly uh, becoming uh, officers of the United States. Uh, they were thinking about people who supported the Confederacy. 
so does that have any application today to uh, Donald Trump uh, long after the Confederacy has uh, ceased to exist? Well, I mean, it's a very interesting question to what extent the Confederacy has ceased to exist. <laughs> because the way that I understand January 6th is not a replay of 1776, even though people had their Revolutionary War flags and they were talking about 1776, and it's not a replay of Southern secession, even though they had the Confederate battle flag too. It's a replay of the period after Reconstruction when the Southern whites took power again. And I said before, Congress removed the disability from a lot of these former Confederates, and they were elected, and they became governors, and they became senators and representatives. And that was the restoration, in a lot of ways, of the Confederacy. That was the restoration of the political power of the former Confederates. And it was the end of multiracial democracy in the South. And that's the moment that I think is the best comparison to January 6th, because January 6th is not an attempt by people to separate in the way that the American Revolution or the Confederate Secession were. It's an attempt to take over the United States government. And I think we, you know, we need to pay attention to that. They're trying to take over the country and impose their will on the rest of us, even though they weren't validly elected. Um, and history shows, I think, that if you let people who have broken an oath to support the Constitution back into power, what you get is the extinction of democracy. Uh, so uh, you don't think there's anything to the argument that the amendment is limited to the Restoration Era and uh, would have no application to uh, January 6th or what we've seen with Donald Trump? No, I don't think so, for, for two reasons. One is it's very common that there are particular events or particular practices that inspire a constitutional amendment. And people writing that amendment have a choice. You can focus very narrowly on what you're prohibiting. And we do this maybe most obviously with like prohibition. Um, but the very narrowly focused amendments often don't work that well. Either they become irrelevant or we decide actually that was a bad idea and then we have the 21st Amendment repealing prohibition. The other thing you can do is you can write more broadly because you're like, this is the particular thing we're thinking about, but there's a broader principle. So the particular thing that the drafters are thinking about is letting former Confederates back into Congress. But they think that there's a broader principle at stake, which is enemies of democracy shouldn't be allowed to control the government. And that's what they put in the Constitution. And I think that's a very sensible principle. Now, the amendment uh, speaks of insurrection and rebellion or rebellion. Uh, is there a difference between insurrection and rebellion? Well, I think so. Uh, so the other thing is if you're an originalist and you look back to how insurrection and rebellion were understood at the time, it turns out it's extraordinarily broad. So any attempt to obstruct, to obstruct the execution of a law of the United States counts as insurrection. And people resisting the Fugitive Slave Act were charged with insurrection because they were trying to protect black people from being dragged back into slavery. So around the time that this is written, there's a very broad understanding of what counts as insurrection. Rebellion is more resistance to government authority and sort of defiance of the idea that the government is legitimate. So is force required in either case? Um, no, that's, that's another one of the interesting things. Force isn't required. So my take on January 6th is it meets any standard because it's basically a violent attempt to overthrow the government of the United States. But if you don't think that and if you want to look at different things and you're an originalist and you're going back to the original understanding of insurrection, it turns out that's incredibly broad. So that covers a lot of things that Trump did, even if you don't, as I do, see this as part of a broad conspiracy. Kermit Roosevelt, Professor Roosevelt, I have a question for you. And the question is, should Donald Trump be disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution? I think he should. I think that he meets all of the criteria that it sets out. He took an oath to support the Constitution. He betrayed that oath when he tried to have himself installed as president, even after losing the election. And I think that our history teaches us this very important lesson that if you let the enemies of democracy back into power, you lose your democracy. 
you lose your democracy. And there's every indication that if they get back into power, uh, they will try to cling to power again and uh, not leave office at the conclusion of their term. Yeah, so we've seen the blueprint for the next Trump administration and the names of the lawyers that he's going to hire and what they want to do to the bureaucracy. And they're very out in the open about dismantling democracy and the rule of law. Dismantling democracy and the rule of law. Kermit Roosevelt, thank you for coming by. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Meanwhile, take care, be well, and all the best.